person beside you. Good evening. My name is Theotis Pace. I'm president of the Kankakee County branch of the NACP. On behalf of our members and officers, uh, Mr. Steve Bertrand, director of the Public Library and his staff, we want to welcome everybody. We want to definitely thank uh, our two candidates, uh, Senator Patrick Joyce and Mr. Eric Wallace. Our panel for the evening is Ms. Yana Smith, community activist, Mr. Chris Breach from the Daily Journal, and the one and only Mr. Mike Rubel <laughs> from the Valley, uh, WVLI. Our timer of the evening is Mr. Jess Gavin. Again, we'd like to thank Ms. Heather Bryant, chairperson of the Kankakee County NACP Political Action Committee. Mr. Uh, Wallace is going to start with the opening statement, and at the end of the forum, Senator George will be the closing. And again, we'd just like to thank everyone uh, for attending and taking time out uh, for this uh, event. Mrs. Smith, you have uh, the first question, but we're going to have Mr. Uh, Wallace to start with his two-minute opening statement. Good evening. I want to first thank the NAACP for holding this forum so the constituents in the 40th District can hear from the candidates. I am Eric M. Wallace, the son of the late John and Dr. Joan Wallace, the husband of Jennifer Wallace and the father of Eric and Greg Wallace, who are both young men. <laughs> I am a member of the clergy, an educator, I hold a PhD in Biblical Studies, I'm a former small business owner, publisher, author, former military, and law enforcement and a proud member of the Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, of which my father was a member for over 60 years. My wife and I currently run a nonprofit called Freedom's Journal Institute for the study of faith and public policy. In 2005, I launched into politics and ran for state senate in the 19th district because I felt that the state of Illinois was steeped in corruption and could never be the great state it should be unless we ran people who had some moral character as a Christian, I felt a duty to step forward. I ran in 2013 and 2014 for Congress after Jesse Jr. was sent to jail. Unfortunately, due to my wife's bout with cancer, we were not able to put together a competitive campaign. Yet the desire to run had not completely faded. Illinois was and still is in a state of disrepair. Her moral walls are in need of fixing. And at a meeting in Washington, D.C., I was reminded about the story of Nehemiah. The story in the Bible is of a cupbearer who, while laboring in exile, hears that the walls of Jerusalem are in disrepair. He receives permission, provision, and protection from the foreign king to return to Jerusalem and repair those walls. Once in Jerusalem, he inspects the damage and speaks to the leadership about his mission. The people agree that they shall rise up and build, Nehemiah 2.18 and they rebuild the walls in 52 days. The theme of our campaign is rise for new beginning. We need to rise and rebuild the moral foundation of our government. RISE is an acronym. The R is responsible government that every citizen expects and deserves. I is individual liberty and fidelity so every citizen has an opportunity to succeed in his or her chosen path. The S is strong family values. We need to give more attention to building strong and healthy families and not fleecing them. The E is for economic empowerment, so everyone has the resources to live out their American dream. I'm asking the voters of the 40th District to rise with me so we may build, build our district for our families, friends, and communities. A further explanation of the RISE principles, there are also videos that are there, are on my website, wallaceforillinois.net. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Joyce, you have two minutes, 40 seconds for your statement. Thank you and good evening. I'd like to thank Kent Key NAACP for hosting this forum. Events like these help educate our voters on all the issues. I'm Patrick Joyce. I've been the state senator for the 40th district for almost 11 months. And what an 11 months has it been. I'm a fourth generation farmer. I have owned a small business in this community for the past 30 years. I've served on the Kent Key County Farm Bureau Board of Directors for 19 of those years. I took on the Senate seat when asked because it was a time in my life when I could devote the time and energy that the people of the 40th District deserve. I like to see right, revitalization in communities that were thriving when I was a young child. 
I firmly believe that the communities of the 40th District can flourish under the right leadership. COVID-19 has consumed us, our municipalities, our counties, our state, and our country. It has hurt local businesses, child care centers, hospitals, and our daily lives. It will take bipartisan community efforts to bring our lives back to a level that we are all yearning for. I've worked with many small businesses and restaurant owners, like the Benoit family, to get their greenhouse deemed essential early on in the pandemic. To more recent meetings with restaurant owners Mark Demo and Joe Armanese and others set up by Jim Byrne to discuss options during our recent mitigation and help fight for their right to reopen. I've worked on bipartisan basis for a good community, working with Representative Parkhurst to get the campgrounds open at the Kanky River State Park. During these challenging times, do we randomly say cut state spending without realizing the impact? Do we tell the Maloney family and Garden of Prayer that we are cutting their funding, thereby stopping much of the great work that they do with foster children, showing them the correct path to faith, belief, and love? There are tough decisions in front of us for sure, but making the correct decisions now under the cloud of a pandemic, they need to be thoughtful. This job puts you in front of many knowledgeable people. That part of the job is what gives me hope. Community leaders across the district have countless suggestions and ideas that will bring our communities back stronger than ever in the coming years. I have been taking on a few projects over the past few months, bringing COVID testing sites to communities, delivering disinfectant throughout the district, working on legislation to bring natural gas to Pembroke Township, fighting for a resolution on the water issues in University Park, bringing resources to help the health of our Kankakee River, meeting with community leaders like J.J. Hollis and discussing Black Lives Matter movement. I will also work hard for the community, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Mrs. Smith, a uh, question to Senator Joyce. Do you support judicial reform? that makes the bail system fair for people who are economically disadvantaged. Cash bail needs to be eliminated. Every person needs to have the same opportunity. Those who cannot afford to get out of jail stay in jail. Those who can afford to get out of jail can get out. That's not fair. Mr. Wallace. That's an excellent question, but before you make a decision whether you're going to get rid of cash bail, you have to ask yourself, what are the consequences? For every decision you make, there's always a consequence. And I'm one of those who wants to say, okay, if, if we take this step, what does that mean? Does it, how, do, how do we then uh, keep people in jail who need to be in jail? How do we, I mean, we want to have an open door policy that once people come in, there's a revolving door for people to come in and out because we still have to take account for those uh, victims of the crime. Um, so I'm, I'm still on the fence about cash bail. I wanna, I wanna take a long and harder look at it and see what's the alternative. What's the alternative to make things work for both the person who's been accused of a crime and the victims? Because we don't wanna put them back on the street to be victimized again, right? So it's, it's not that easy a solution, at least in, in my point of view. Were you finished, Mr. Oh, Wallace, yes. that you wanted to add on? Because uh, we would allow uh, Mr. Uh, Senator George to rebuttal. So was there any, anything else? No, no. I'm done. Uh, Mr. Breach, you have the question, the question to uh, Mr. Wallace. What are two measures that you would promote to help revitalize the communities in the 40th district? Revitalizing the communities? Wow, there's, there's so many things that need to happen um, even before some of that happens. One of my biggest issues is the corruption that goes on in the, in the state. Uh, that I think we pay a big corruption tax. Um, I mean, we're looking at the, the ComEd issue with, uh, with Michael Madigan and the things that go on, go on, that we end up getting robbed because somebody makes a deal and then we end up paying more elect a higher electric bill, we're paying more. It makes it more difficult then for, for businesses to do what they need to do. It makes it more difficult for homeowners to pay 
they're paying higher electric bills and have less money. Uh, I think corruption is a, is a huge issue. Um, I think we also need to think of ways in which to uh, structure some bills to help people start businesses, to open up businesses. To, obviously with COVID, um, we're, 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 in a, we're in a pickle, if, if you will, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Uh, to be able to shore up those um, those businesses, and at the same time, then you've got uh, um, uh, property taxes. So there's a number of different issues that we have to tackle um, in order to help bring viability back into the community uh, and and to make this community thrive. Uh, and there's more than that. A actually, there's some others I hope we'll get to later on in this discussion. Senator Joyce. Businesses are hurting for sure. Um, being able to educate the community and business opportunities on how the grant process in Illinois works. It seems like it's a big secret. One of the things that I've been doing um, with community meetings is to educate them how the process does work and getting them in touch with grant writers, good grant writers. You could have two projects. One project has a poor grant writer, the other one deserves it. And they have a, but if you have a better grant writer, you're gonna get that grant. That's not fair. But those type of education programs and making sure the general public knows how grant, grant opportunities work, I think are vital to the entire 40th district. The other is the Kankakee River. We have an untapped resource here that is underutilized, and that's not even close to the right way to, to put it. We are let, watching our river be choked with sand, and it has so many opportunities along the banks of it, and uh, just recreational-wise, those are two, two areas that could really help the 40th District. Mr. Rubel, you have the question. The question is to uh, Senator Joyce. Please tell us your reaction to the ComEd scandal, its effect on Michael Madigan, and indeed the whole idea of term limits. The allegations are disturbing on Michael Madigan, and if they're found true, Michael Madigan needs to resign immediately. Um, term limits. I feel as though I'm in the middle of a term limit right now. You have a general election. I have one now, I have one in two years, and we'll see after the, the census when the next one is. But every time you run for election, your, your term is possibly limited. I think that there should be term limits in leadership. Anyone who's in leadership as long as Speaker Madigan has been, it's, it's not healthy for the state of Illinois. So as far as a general election goes, I think that's a term limit every time you run. I think that term limits should be placed on leadership. Mr. Wallace. I would agree almost with almost everything he said, except to, I think Michael Madigan obviously needs to step down. I think Michael Madigan has been one of the reasons why we've had all this corruption in Illinois. And the fact that he's got so much power as the, the leader of the Democrat Party and, and the, and the uh, Speaker of the House gives him enormous, enormous power. Now, as far as term limits, I, I, I agree that every election is, is about term limits. However, I would, I would be happier with it if we stopped having the gerrymandered districts. Gerrymandered districts means that the same people get elected over and over again. So it's not really a referendum on, on that person, not really a uh, term limit piece. If you're in a district that is, that is you know, like 80% Democrat or 80% Republican, we need to have more, di have districts drawn that are more competitive. So we can't have, so if, so if you're tired of the Democrat who's there and they're not doing what they say they're gonna do, you can put a Republican in there. So, I, so right now, we really don't have that. But I agree with the whole idea about term limits for leadership. We should have term limits for, for leadership. And I think we should, uh, should allow, if we can fix the districts so they're not gerrymandered, then I would be okay with just saying, okay, every election is, is a uh, stop, okay. <laughs> you, you used the term for one of the questions that we have, and it's about gerrymandering. So it says that uh, it's bad, gerrymandering is bad. Right. But the party in power is in the state, so which is the Democrats. Is this and doing anything about it? Or is it wrong or what should be done? I would like to see a, a 
a neutral party actually, like if, whether it's a computer, or computer software, or something, figure it out so that the, that the districts are more competitive. And that people, because I, I believe that you get better service when you have competitive, when there's competition amongst the parties. Problem has been, uh, and one of the reasons I decided to run, because the last time I voted for somebody in the state senate, there was nobody, there was no Republican running. And the Republican Party didn't come get me and say, Eric, would you be willing to run? I jumped up and decided that as, a, as somebody who felt God was calling them to be involved in politics, that I needed to run and give people within the district an alternative. If you don't, it, there's nothing good about one party rule, nothing. Even when it's all, all Republicans or all Democrats, we need to have districts that, that allow both parties to have somebody in it and to, and to vie for your vote. Okay, thank you. Senator, you have the rebuttal uh, regarding the question uh, reference to gerrymandering. Sure. I, I've said many, many times, that, uh, draw a rectangle, I'll represent it. If you're doing a good job as a legislator, you will get elected and, and pay attention to your constituents. The Civil Rights Act was passed 35, 40 years ago that would make sure that representation of black and brown communities and white communities all have representation in our state. It's, I think, very, very important that we just get it right and have proper representation. And as I said before, I could represent a rectangle. Mrs. Smith, you have a question, and the question will be to Senator Joyce. Can you commit to supporting legislation that builds on the Trust Act for new proposals to make Illinois more welcoming for immigrant communities? To make Illinois more? Welcoming. Oh, yes, I can. Um, I think that every person, I mean, we've lost sight of this was the American dream for centuries. And I think that we need to make sure that every immigrant has an opportunity and has an opportunity to do a good job, get paid for good wages, have a clear path to citizenship. So yes, I would. Mr. Wallace. It depends on whether you're talking about legal immigrants or illegal immigrants. I'm all for legal immigrants having an opportunity. Um, like it's been said, this country has been built on, you know, legal immigrants coming in. My problem with illegal immigrants is that they cut the line for those who have been waiting in line, and I don't think that's fair. Now, do we need to come up with another process? Do we need to do something about our immigration? Uh, how we do immigration? Yes, probably. Um, it would make some sense because we need some good, it'd be good to have good people come into the United States, uh, bringing their, their services uh, and so forth. But um, you know, I'm, not, I'm not for the illegal immigration and, and, and making folks um, feel comfortable because it's been argued that a lot of the illegal immigrants end up taking jobs away from those who are actually American citizens. And um, I, I, I can't support that. Mr. Breach, a uh, question to uh, Mr. Wallace. Would you be in favor of cutting state programs to reduce the state's debt? If so, what would you cut? <laughs> Can I phone a friend? <laughs> um, look, that's, that's a difficult question. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's going to have to happen. Uh, because you can't continue to spend money you don't have. Um, deciding which things to be cut, that's a, whole nother, that's a whole nother issue that you have to sit down and look through and see what, if there's any fat anywhere that you can cut, if there's anything that can be um, maybe divvied out to um, faith-based community or other communities that can handle uh, some other issues that, this, that the government has been handling but maybe shouldn't uh, be handling. Um, and it's just figuring out what that is. We're going to have to tighten our belt because we've lost a lot of money through COVID. And it's just not going to fall out of the sky. Um, so to be responsible, yeah. I mean, we're going to have to cut something. What, what it is, I'm, I'm not down in Springfield. Um, others may have a better idea as to what could be cut. Senator Joyce? We have 
about $21 billion in discretionary spending. But those discretionary spending dollars deal with education, human services, and public safety. 10% cuts across the board on the discretionary spending would, would yield about $2.1 billion. But as I said in my opening statement, we need to be very thoughtful in how we do this and what agencies we are looking to cut. Those department heads have a better gauge on where those monies could possibly come from in each of their departments. The governor has asked each agency to hold 5% of their current budget for FY21, and in FY22, come up with 10% cuts. So it's coming. I mean, we have to pay for COVID. But the easier way is that our national leadership needs to step up to the plate. Illinois, as well as 49 other states, is in the same predicament because of COVID-19. We are seeing a severe lack in national leadership. It's every municipality, 90 or what is it, 20 or 87 percent of municipalities in the state of Illinois have a 20 to 30 percent revenue shortfall because of COVID-19. And that's across the country. We need help from the federal, de federal de delegation also. So Senator Joyce, um, looking at the number of questions, so what we're going to do, we're going to give you additional time. Mr. Wallace will get the, uh, the same time. So let's talk about uh, shortfall and how we would deal with education. What's your thoughts on uh, criminal justice reform uh, in, the, uh, in the state of Illinois with the climate that is going on across the nation? Criminal justice reform is part of what the, the, the Senate Black Caucus is coming up with four pillars. Criminal justice reform is the first of those four pillars. Um, some of the things that we need to look at is I firmly believe in every officer in the state of Illinois having a camera on them. I think that that is, gives clarity and um, transparency to both sides. And I think it's something that's very necessary. Uh, also, training of those officers is crucial. And I think that we have found over the last six months where we are lacking in, in the way of training with, of our officers. The state police have a very regimented training program. When you start to get down the ladder to counties and municipalities, they don't have those training standards. And, the, and finally, I would say that every officer needs to carry his record with him. In the state of Illinois, if an officer acts up in another part of the country or in another part of the state and they apply for the Kankakee City Police Department, their record does not go with them. Every other professional job carries a record with him. Doctors, lawyers, I think that police officers should also. Okay, so education, the shortfall, um, the, how would we, again, uh, fund our education systems in a, in a much better way than the, the, the budget that we passed um, in May, we maintained um, our education budget. The previous year, we had increased it by $350 million. Our intention was to increase it another $500 million. And because of COVID-19, that's not going to happen. But we did do a maintenance budget where it maintained the level where it was the previous year, which was $350 million higher than the previous year to that. So we are heading in the right direction. COVID has thrown this state a curveball that's going to take us a couple of years to get out. But I think that the current administration is, is dedicated to increase funding of higher education as well as K through 12 um, for the years to come. Mr. Wallace. Yeah, those are two big questions you're asking. <laughs> so which one do you want me to answer first, the, the police it's, reform? It, it's on you. I'm sorry? It's on you. Okay, you deal with the I'll, I'll go to the police reform. reform. What, what are the, the education? One what, what of the things with, with police reform, one of the problems with, with trying to fix that is that you have a, an act called the Illinois Public Labor Relations Act, which actually, um, what it says, it titles, uh, the provision entitled the act takes precedence over any other bills that we, or any laws that we try and put forward. Um, 
let me see here. The section explicitly details that when a contract between a government union unit, such as the police department, and a union is in conflict with any other law or regulation, the contract prevails. So whatever's in the contract, even if you try to come up with some other statute or something else, unless you change the Illinois Public Labor Relations Act, you're out of luck. You can't change anything. The contract over, uh, supersedes any other laws that you put forward. So if we're serious about trying to change some stuff in our in a, uh, some police reform, I'm all for the cameras. I, I think that's a great idea. I think that helps police as well as the, uh, the, the, the people that are being stopped. It keeps police from being accused of doing something they didn't do. And the same thing with the, the, the person who's being arrested or, or being questioned by the police. But until you fix this, one of the things they say is that the, the FOP con, uh, contract controls which complaints are investigated. It says once an investigation is uh, alleged misconduct is init, init, excuse me, once an invest, investigation into alleged misconduct is initiated, the FOP contract requires that officers be given certain information to aid in their shaping of their official statements. Imagine that. Purposeful secrecy in the FOP contract uh, impedes future uh, review and leaves the public in the dark. So there are certain things that are already set up that make it difficult for us to get behind what's happening um, with our police officers. And I'm all for getting rid of bad, I'm a former police officer myself. I'm for getting rid of bad cops because it makes all cops look bad. But we're gonna have to change this, um, like I said, the Illinois Public Labor Relations Act before we can do anything about it. So with the 40th district, uh, particularly here in Kankakee County, there's only one municipality that have uh, body camps, which is the village of Bourbon A. So with Senator Joyce four, and, and the Black Caucus, four pillars, how would we fund the other municipalities, such as uh, Bradley, uh, the city of Kankakee, which is the largest population of a particular minority population within uh, the county? So how would, we, how would you assist uh, with the funding of uh, body camps? And uh, uh, Senator Joyce, you have a chance to rebuttal and address that. I didn't get a chance to get to education. Well, but anyway. Well, now you got education and the funding <laughs> of, of, uh, <laughs> of Man, you just camp. So this, you, you, you got it, and uh, the time got you down here. Okay, you're just piling on on me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> as far as education is concerned, I know we, they came up with a new formula. I think on, on, it was under Rauner where they signed the evidence-based funding model uh, to try and give more money to uh, various districts that, that um, you know, needed more funding. Obviously, that's going to be a problem. I know we're trying to get to state funding where we're giving at least 90% of the money uh, to school systems. Um, we're supposed to add another $350 million. Um, my thing is, and, and the problem I have with that is that none of it's earmarked. They can use it however they want to. And I'm not one for just throwing money at schools and expecting them to get better. It's how you spend the money. I think it should be spent in the classrooms. And I'm one of those who force school choice. I think we need, there are no charter schools out here uh, in the Kankakee area. We have a charter school, actually it's not in the 40th district, um, South Suburban Prep. I think it's just outside the district. But the kids are going there and they're gangbusters. And they're, I think everyone who's graduating from that school is going to college. Now, I'm not saying everybody wants to go to college. I'm for also opening up vocational schools. Uh, not everybody wants to go. We should be teaching people how to, young people, um, other skills so they come right out of high school and can work. That'll keep them off, off the streets. But to your other question, you have to ask it for me again because I've forgotten now. It's the one, the, the village of Bourbon A. Oh, oh, finding the, money. Well, that's always the $100,000 question, isn't it? Where's the money coming from? And um, there may be a couple of different ways to try and figure that out. The money doesn't always, money for these kind of things don't always have to come out of Springfield. Sometimes you can put something together and say, hey, we're trying to raise X number of dollars to buy cameras for the police department. You figure out how much that is, how much that is and maybe you have some kind of fundraiser to raise money for the cameras. Um, uh, maybe it's going to some of that discretionary fund money and, and, and trying to figure out how do we, how do we pay for these. Uh, but it's something we need to look into. Um, I'm not saying I have the answer at the moment, but I'm not... <clears throat> I'm one of those who wants to think outside the box as well when it comes to trying to funding. Okay. 
interesting, fun things. Senator Joyce. Well, I think you're going to do a com you're going to have to do a combination of of, of a couple different things. Um, number one, as Mr. Wallace said, the, the discretionary fund has 21 billion dollars in it. There's a lot of different things that have to be paid for out of that fund. Portions of that could come from there. I mean, we've got a, a large part of public safety comes from that fund, and I think that would be something that those department heads would have to look at. If we look at statewide body cameras, what's that going to cost the state of Illinois? What, what are some of the other things in that public safety sector that we are currently paying for? And then you'd also look on a local level. So I think that uh, a combination of those three things, um, I, I, and I think that the communities will be a, a supportive of it because of the transparency that it brings. Smith, you have the question, and the question is to uh, Mr. Wallace. Do you support Black Lives Matter? Why? I support the, um, the statement Black Lives Matter. I don't support the organization because the organization, matter of fact, uh, when the organization first came out and we started looking at behind it, um, that, it was, that it was run, um, well, that, that actually their statements on their website were not didn't seem to really be concerned about black lives. It was about a number of other things, about Marxism, it was about lesbianism, it was about black liberation. Um, I had problems with that. And as an ordained minister, I just, uh, even finding out now, as, as we even look further behind it, that some of the stuff that they're into is uh, ancestor worship. Uh, see, the, the, the old civil rights movement was led by ministers, um, which I identified with. This has kind of turned everything on its head because it, it's talking about Dr. King talked about judging us by the content of our character, not by the color of our skin. Black Lives Matter acts as though it wants to judge us by the color of our skin, not by the content of our character. So my wife and I actually started with our, our nonprofit organization. We started an org uh, initiative called Black Families Matter. Because if we really care about black lives, we'll do something about black families. When black families fall apart, then you have problems with your children, especially young black men who don't want to listen to the police when, when they get stopped. So, uh, no, I'm not, I'm not for the organization. Obviously, I, I agree with that because I'm a black man. I got black children. I got a black wife. So black lives do matter. But uh, if I'm going to push anything, I'm going to push black families matter. Thank you. Senator Joyce. When we, uh, COVID-19 has exposed a lot of inequities in our uh, in the 40th district, as well as the state of Illinois and the country. Uh, Cook County, when we got the hospital assessment um, numbers back, and I received it, and I had Riverside and St. Mary's on it, and I said, where are the hospitals in the northern part of my district? There aren't any. There's a hospital desert in the northern part of the 40th district. There's a food desert in the northern part of the 40th district. You see lines right now, because of COVID, that are six and a half times at food pantries what they normally are. So yes, there's inequities. I've met with Travis Miller, I've met with J.J. Hollis on some of the local issues when they were protesting in the streets. And in that meeting, I said, we have to have a purpose, you have to have a plan. And I was talking to them again about grant opportunities that an initiative Every initiative needs money. And trying to walk them through how that works and, and continue to work with them to this day. Protesting with a purpose is essential. Violence and looting is unacceptable. Case closed. So yes, I do support it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Breach, question to Senator Joyce. You are both small business owners, how would you work with the state legislator to help small businesses in the 40th district? Interesting now, um, during COVID-19, how much that's needed. Uh, we are seeing businesses close, restaurants, bars, other small businesses that are impacted. Um, I hate to keep circling back to COVID-19, but it, it is here. and. Um, being able to teach our youth 
on how to put together a business plan, how to read a profit and loss statement, how to deal with bankers. Those are things that are essential um, on a day-to-day -day basis, how to do payroll, how to train people, how to keep files on those things. These are very, very basic skills that every small business owner needs to know. And um, I've learned a lot of those through college, but I learned most of them by doing it, and some of them the hard way. So I think that would probably be the, the most important one is to um, the training and um, knowledge that small businessmen have and making sure that we have outreach programs. When you do have um, our young people that want to start a business, have a mentor. Those are the type of programs that need to be developed. Mr. Wallace. Yeah, a couple of things. One, one of them goes back to whole vocational schools, maybe have something uh, uh, Talk about business, how to start a business, uh, being an entrepreneur in high school, a uh, program like that. Uh, one of the things we also need to do is get rid of special licensing. Sometimes that, that, is, co that is costly for people. Why do you need a license to, to cut hair? Um, we, uh, you know, there, there are other kinds of licensing that stop people from, and, and a lot of it's, it's, it's done to actually stop a competition because if you, can't, if you can't afford to go out and get a license for whatever it is, you, you can't do it. The other one is, is uh, cut back on raising the minimum wage. Uh, you know how hard it is for, for people to start businesses and then have to pay somebody $15 an hour. You can't afford the help. And I've talked to a few businessmen who have said basically that. Um, we want to say that it, it tries to help people um, you know, take care of their families, but there are some people, actually the minimum wage was supposed to actually help young people get a foot in the door to actually start working and become responsible. Now we've actually priced them out of the marketplace and we've got people, I would say that's one of the reasons why we got more crime and other stuff going on because young people can't find jobs. You're not going to pay somebody $15 an hour that doesn't have any skills. So we need to, we need to stop raising the minimum wage Instead of raising minimum wage, we need to find ways in which to help people increase their skill sets. Stop falsely paying them more money. Help them build their skill sets. And whether that's in, again, in high school or whether it's community college, um, whatever it is, I don't care. I think that we should have a number of different ways in which we do that. Senator Joyce. Well, I've already answered that one, Theodos. <laughs> yeah, I have you. Uh, Mr. Rubel, question, uh, and the question is to Mr. Wallace. Do you think the state has responded well to the COVID crisis, and what would you change? Um, no, I don't. Uh, I, I think, well, let me put it this way. I, I, I do think the governor is concerned about the health and well-being of the citizens of Illinois. Okay, I'll, I'll give him that. Though I think there's, it's been somewhat draconian in a way, in the way they've shut down certain areas and other things have been open. I mean, you've got big box stores open and they can do business, but smaller mom and pop stores aren't open. And, you, and it's just, I mean, people look at it and feel like it's just not, it's not fair. And so what I would have rather have done, like to have seen happen is that the governor lays out the guidelines. This is how we need to conduct ourselves. We need to wear masks. We need the distance. We need to do all these various things, okay? Uh, but then allow people to, you know, be grown-ups, right? <laughs> um, you know, you take certain risks. Every time we come out, I took a risk coming down here. I drove down from Flossmoor, down 57. Of course, going north on 57, it was all closed off because there were some, some gunshots. <laughs> so I'm taking a risk and on the highway getting down here. So, I mean, so, so we... we um, we look at the risk and we decide whether we're going to do that. People are frustrated that they haven't been able to go to church. Now, some people are actually, some, uh, some Catholic churches I know are open and people are having church. My church has been closed. Uh, we're not having church. Um, and so I don't think it's, some of it has been fair in the way it's been, the way he's closed down stuff and the way he's opened up other stuff. Um, I would say, you know, allow adults be adults, let them make certain decisions. I think one of the things we were trying to do was trying to keep people, trying to keep the hospitals from being filled up. Um, we're not going to keep people from getting COVID. Um, they're either going to get infected or they're going to get a, a shot or, uh, or something like that, but it's, it's not going away. And 
we need to realize that, you know, we need to protect the vulnerable. I'm sorry, I had to stop. Mr. Rubel, you have a question. Any questions to Mr. Wallace? No, I, I need sorry. to answer that one. You got He's got the notice. Um, Mr. Joyce needs to respond. In the, yeah. in the uh, lack of national leadership, our governor took a leadership role for our state. Early on in this pandemic, Go ahead. Early on in this pandemic, um, the governor took on leadership based on science and the medical community. We didn't know what was coming. You could say that we overreacted, but what if we hadn't? We needed to be prepared. As we move through COVID-19 and things change, uh, we are adjusting our strategy. I don't agree with everything that we are doing un under the current mitigation. Um, I've been talking to my local hospital CEOs, Chris Stride and Phil Kambick, and they're not seeing a big influx. So when we went into mitigation over 8%, there was still no one in the hospitals. So on the Illinois uh, public health phone calls, I asked the question of what is the 8% based on? And there were some tough e economic times for the bars and restaurants, and that industry was taking it on the chin. And they wanted to know why it was just them. And I thought that was a very valid point. Uh, we were doing, uh, starting to trace where the COVID was coming from, but we were not, not doing it fast enough. So as we progress through this, I think that um, a more local approach would be something that uh, I, I hope the governor's office um, it takes heed with. Um, I think that if we are not overwhelming hospitals, we need to do a little bit of uh, experimenting with that percentage of, of COVID positive and get both, keep our people safe and also keep our economy going. Senator Joyce, uh, can you expound on the unfunded pension liability, uh, which is no easy solution in sight? And uh, in November, the voters will uh, go, well, we'll vote in now to change the Constitution from the flat uh, income tax to a graduate tax. Uh, you want to expound on that and how sure. you support this idea, right. particularly with the middle uh, class taxpayers, and how can we protect them from um, taxes being raised any other time? Okay. First off, on the, on the pension. The pension has been building up for in excess of 30 years. Um, we went from a tier one to a tier two pension program about eight years ago, and be nine years ago now. We have not missed a payment on our pension program since then. Um, I've been in office 10 months. I didn't have a lot to do with what happened 30 years ago, but I want to maintain uh, paying our pension debt. And it's a long range plan, but we are not missing the payments currently. And it's a 25 year run to get funded. But when we move to tier two, it is more sustainable. And that's why that was changed nine years ago. Um, as far as the graduated tax, um, it is really up to everyone in this room as to how it's voted. It is not a referendum of the Senate. It is not a referendum of the House. It's a referendum of the people at this point. I voted for it. I see where there's opportunities. 97% of Illinoisans will pay the same or less. There's a calculator. You can go online and do it. I put my wife's and my income from last year in it. We're going to save $95 with the fair tax. Wow. Um, I've heard comments that each of the categories can be changed by the legislature. Well, the tax can be changed by the legislature now. I will never vote for changing those different percentages on the on the graduated tax. Mr. Wallace. Okay, now you got to remind me because I was listening. We was talking about the underfunded of the pension liability. Okay, pension liability. Pension liability. Uh, one of the things we should be doing instead of changing the um, changing the tax, the flat tax to uh, to to raise taxes, we should be changing the uh, pension how we do pensions because it's in the obviously it's in the uh, constitution and if you change it from uh, uh, a guaranteed a defined benefit to a, a defined uh, contribution uh, and I think we do that and start 
uh, obviously people are already in the pension plan should stay in the pension plan, okay? But new people who are coming through um, should be on a di whole different plan uh, because we can't, we can't sustain the kind of uh, pension plan that we've got, you know, right now. Um, and Illinois Policy Institute actually has three, recommended three <clears throat> ideas that actually balance the budget. One of them was amend the Constitution, which I just said, so that the uh, growth in the future, not yet earned pension benefits, can be reduced to a level that is sustainable and affordable. Um, it says align responsibility for paying new pension benefits with accountability for negotiating uh, the uh, compensation for school and universities. So have them responsible for that. And then the last one was invest in K through 12 uh, a little differently. Um, so there's a way to handle that, but we're not dealing with it. Uh, we're going to kick the can down the road. Um, the problem with the fair tax is that they've keep, they keep promising us. He said he was right. They can raise the, uh, uh, the tax rates right now, but they have to raise it on everybody. And they tried that once, and a lot of people end up losing their, their positions because nobody likes paying higher taxes. When you start saying, oh, we're going to get the rich people, well, then people um, start saying, yeah, we get the rich because they got money. Um, <clears throat> But, but that won't solve our problem because there aren't enough rich people you know, to pay enough taxes. I want to read this to you, though, that somebody wrote about the promises that, that politicians make during, the, um, during a campaign. This is like the political promise that the lottery money would go to schools or that Illinois toll roads would be temporary or that in the 1989 tax hike would be temporary or that the uh, 2011 income tax hike would fix the state's debt problems or that 2017 tax hike would put an end to the two decades of unbalanced budgets, or in two, I'm almost done, 2019 property tax relief uh, force would, would, would give homeowner owner, owners a break. They've not kept any of their promises. They made promise after promise after promise of what, what's gonna happen uh, with taxes, and, and they never keep their promises. So no, I'm not for the, 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 the tax increase. They call it a fair tax. There's nothing fair about it. Was I out of time? I didn't see that. Yeah, okay. yeah. Senator George, you gave me an additional time to, to read Yeah, I, I mean, when, when Mr. Wells says they, they don't keep their promises. I, I'm not they. I mean, I, I understand what he's saying, but uh, um, I'm saying it right now that I will not vote to change those. The way that it's set up right now, I believe it is very fair. If those percentages were to change, it wouldn't be as fair. But you won't see me voting against it. Okay. Mr. Rube, a question and the questions to Mr. Wallace. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about the upcoming <clears throat> excuse me, what are your thoughts about the upcoming redistricting? Is that to me? I, I believe so. What are my thoughts? I kinda I thought I kinda answered that earlier, but I'll, I'll say again, I, I'd love to see a nonpartisan um, whether it's a computer program or some other agency come in and do it, whether the courts have to get involved. Uh, I don't like the gerrymandering. I mean, people will ask me, uh, you know, what is, you know, the district to tell me what, what the parameters are of the district. I, have, I told them, you need to go to my website and look at the, the map because it's so gerrymandered. It's, <laughs> it's hard. I mean, I can tell you it's, it's in Cook County, Will County, Grundy, and uh, Kankakee. And I can tell you some of the cities in that. But, you know, it splits down some of the, you know, down a street. And, and I guess it might do that anyway, but it is so gerrymandered that it's um, that that is different, and it's set up in a way so that so that Democrats will win. I mean, I know why it's set up this way. That you know, generally speaking, the Democrats will win Cook County. Cook County. The only difference here is that I actually live in Cook County and know people in Cook County. So my hope is I can convince some folks who would normally vote the Democrat Party to vote for me. Um, but you know. He lives in Kankakee County, which, you know, <laughs> which makes it even more, a little bit more difficult because I was hoping to win, you know, Kankakee County because Kankakee is generally Republican. So it's 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 a little bit more difficult, this uh, complicated, especially with COVID. But um, I think we should stop the gerrymandering as much as possible. So people actually have competition with, with within each district. And you have to we have to come out, come together. We have to have forms like this and put forth our ideas, um, and then people can make up their mind. Well, when I first saw the map of the 40th district, I don't disagree with a lot of what Mr. Wallace said. It's a, it's a funny looking map. Um, the part that really disturbs me is that we are splitting up communities 
um, in the 40th district. I mean, a lot of communities get split in half. Coal City is split in half. Park Forest is split in half. I mean, I think there's like nine communities that part of them, Frankfurt, New Lenox, I mean, you just go down the list. I would like to find a way of drawing a map that gets constituencies in a village all in the same district. And however you need to draw those lines, and you know, a square doesn't work, a rectangle doesn't work, because you have to have a certain number of votes. Um, I understand that, but at all costs, I would like to keep as many communities as we can whole. Mrs. Smith, you have a question to Senator Joyce. Okay, what a very important date that just passed, September 30th, 2020, in terms of the census. How important is or was the 2020 census to our district? Every person that is not counted in the census costs our district $14,000. At, uh, I think it was about September 10th, the city of Kankakee was at 60%. And that's when we were starting to have a lot of um, awareness meetings and the people that keep going to the meetings are the people that have already filled out the census but at that 60 percent count Kankakee was going to lose 166 million dollars over the next 10 years that's a lot of potholes it's a lot of street lights it pays for our, our health care it pays for our roads it pays for our infrastructure it is imperative that we get counted so I reached out to Dick Durbin's office, and I said, I need to get the list of all the addresses that haven't filled out the census yet because I wanted to help. Couldn't get it. No one would release the administration. Our national administration would not release the census data so that we could get a proper count. Now, I thought that was constitutionally required, and that was very, very disappointing, and it made it very challenging. But it's very, very important that everyone gets counted, and it, it's federal dollars to our community. Mr. Wallace? Yeah, the only thing I'd add to that is, is that um, it'll change how our districts are drawn. Because you have to, you draw the districts by the number of, by, by the population. Uh, so that's um, House districts, that's Senate districts, that's also congressional districts. It looks like we may lose a congressional seat. Uh, because of people that have been leaving to congressional seats because people are leaving Illinois uh, and going elsewhere. So we, do, we need to have an accurate count. So you get the right representation you're supposed to have. And so the districts get drawn in a way that is representative of, uh, of the population. Mr. Preacher, if your question is to uh, Mr. Wallace. What will you do to help increase jobs in the 40th district? My answer is yes. Um, that was a joke that didn't go over well. Okay. <laughs> Increased jobs? Well, uh, you know, with COVID, it's, it's trying to bring some job. you know, trying to help save jobs from going under, um, trying to find ways in which to, to get money. Um, the, the hope is that, you know, at least at the federal level, um, It'd be, it'd be nice if there were some kind of money that comes from the federal level, but you know, I'm skeptical of that and the way that our governor and, and uh, the mayor of, of uh, Chicago keep going after the president. You can't continue to go after the, <laughs> the person who could help get you money and expect him to give you money um, when you ask for it, when you're looking for it. Um, again, that's a million dollar question. How do, how do we help these businesses stay in business and then how do we uh, help uh, other businesses uh, uh, grow. I mean, we've had Amazon decide, unfortunately, you know, Amazon is not building in our district, but at least it's building close to the district, so some people may be able to get some, some work from there. Uh, we're still talking about the airport. That may come out at some point. I still don't think that's going to happen for another 10 years, if it happens. But, um, yeah, uh, that's a really good question. I'm not sure I have the answer to that, uh, to be quite honest. And I'm not afraid to say I don't know from time to time. Uh, that's a hard question because 
people are struggling to make ends meet. And I think we have to, again, we can't allow the, the state to continue to stay on lockdown. We've got to open up and allow people to get out, those who do have money to go out and support the businesses that are still here. You can't close them down. There are a lot of black businesses that are going under because they don't have reserves, because they can't work from home. And so the only thing I can see right now and in the immediate future is to open things up for us to, uh, to have our businesses. And then in the future, we have to look at, okay, how do we get more money to help these businesses that need Thank you, Mr. Lord. Senator Joyce. A year ago, the Rebuild Illinois legislation was passed in Springfield to try to fix our crumbling infrastructure. Um, Illinois has some sewers and roads and bridges that are in disrepair. That Rebuild Build Illinois program is bringing jobs. The highway motor fuel tax <clears throat> was added. Look around. There are roads being fixed everywhere right now, just in this community. Finding additional rever revenue resources was part of that Rebuild Illinois program, and it's something that we need to continue. Again, COVID-19 has thrown that program a real curveball, and it's, it's made some challenges to, to job infrastructure. But vocational training of our youth is something that we need to really, really build on. College isn't for everyone, but everyone deserves a good paying job. And through vocational training, KCC has an awesome vocational training program. So does Prairie State College. Those type of vocational training programs are what's gonna educate our youth and an educated person can get a really good paying job. Those are the, some of the ways that in the right steps that we're taking. Mr. Rube, you have the question, the question to Senator Joyce. How would you go about assisting district residents that are on limited income with utilities and in terms of medical con concerns they have? There, there are so many CARES Act programs out right now for um, those type of situations. Um, making sure that each person gets um, the information out there, communicating from my perspective, from the Senate seat, we make sure that we're communicating all the time through our Facebook page, through our website, and, and through email blasts, um, those type of things, and then our communications with community leaders on those programs is <clears throat> essential. Um, if people don't know about a program, they won't participate in a program. So really this job is about communication and relationships. And that's how you educate the people that need those funds. That's how you do it, is myself talking with constituents and community leaders and, and making sure that they're aware of what's out there. Can't add a, lot, a whole lot to that, uh, except to talk about faith-based uh, organizations that, that are there to help um, government resources that have already been set aside for things like like this and then of course he's already as as uh, Senator Joyce has already mentioned com other community organizations that come in to help I mean there's there's been a lot going on in terms of of people giving food um, that there have been pop-up pantries that 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 pop up and I've you know I've been involved outside the district and in the district I'm a good friend of mine in Chicago, uh, Corey Brooks, were out there and he fed, he said he was gonna feed like 6,000 families or 5,000 families, something ridiculous like that. It was, it, was, it was amazing that he was able to do that. It was a very hot day as well. So, <laughs> but uh, I was glad to be able to participate in that. Other organizations giving money, I think the Alphas have done some stuff and, and other organizations that get involved in trying to help in ways that they can help. Now that was with food, uh, how they help with, uh, help paying utilities and things like that. Uh, I think something could be set up like that as well. Thank you. We, we, again, we'd like to thank both of you, Senator Joyce and Mr. Eric Wallace, for uh, taking time out of your busy schedule. Um, and so we're asking for the two-minute uh, closing statement. We're going to start with you, Mr. Wallace. Wallace. Oh, I thought it was his. No, you, no, it's you me. started. Yeah, you and closing by. Uh, oh, and Senator I thought it was only a minute, so I've only I've we got, got two a, minutes. I've got a short one. <laughs> well, again, I want to thank the uh, NAACP for inviting us out. It's always great to be able to, to sit here and actually share 
what you believe and why you believe what you believe. Um, <clears throat> in this election, so mine's going to be short. In this election, you have a chance to do something different. You know, they say insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, inspecting different results. You can do something different. Electing the first, I, I didn't know this when I first started to run, but if I get elected, I'll be the first black Republican since 1939. Uh, and that would shake up both parties. It's been 81 years. Can you imagine that? 81 years. Now, the first two, first two black uh, state senators uh, were Republican. Um, but we haven't had one since. Uh, the last one was William E. King from 1935 to 1939. And it will signal to both that you're tired of the status quo. And it'll demand something different from the Republicans and from the Democrats. It'll tell the Democrats we're, we're tired of doing having the same old, same old. They've controlled the, the 40th district for decades. But now, and, and the Republican Party has not done much of anything either. I'm disappointed in my party. I told them I was a, I had to inform them that I was the only African. I'm the only African American running for state Senate in the whole state. And one group actually clapped, and I looked at them and said, that's not something to clap about. <laughs> that's a problem. But we need to make a difference. We need to stand up for responsible government, for individual liberty and fidelity, for strong family values and economic empowerment. These are what we have called the RISE principles. And we're asking people in the 40th district to rise for a new beginning, that you elect me, your new senator, and we'll change this district, district for the better. Thank you. Thank you. Senator DeJoyce. Thank you again to the NAACP to, uh, ha on having this forum. COVID-19 has stretched Illinois resources to their limit. The 40th District deserves someone capable of obtaining the resources necessary for our community to come out of this pandemic stronger than ever. Listening to constituents and connecting them with the agency or person they need has been a necessary focus of my team over the past several months. I've used the phrase, constitu phrase constituent services on steroids to describe the great need for the people of the 40th district on issues like COVID testing, PPE shortages, Illinois unemployment issues, Secretary of State issues. Our state is learning a lot about preparedness and, and adaptation. I will fight for increased vocational training of our youth because college isn't for everyone, but everyone deserves a good paying job. I will fight for the simplification and more transparency in our health care system and decrease, decrease costs in prescription drugs. People should never have to choose between buying their medication and putting food on the table. I will fight for increased state funding towards the education of our children to ease the burden of our local property taxes. I encourage everyone to fill out the census if you haven't already. Doing so has a great impact on federal dollars in our communities over the next 10 years. I will continue to give the people of the 40th District the common courtesy of an open line of communication, continue to show by example what a good public servant can be. I've been a hard worker my entire life, and I plan to put that work ethic to good use for the people of the 40th District. In closing, for those of you who know me, you know I'll do what's best for the community. For those of you who don't, ask around, or look up on my website, electpatrickjoyce.com. I am Patrick Joyce, and I ask you to make me your choice November 3rd. Thank you again uh, to both of the candidates, our panelists, our timer, and Ms. Heather Brand and the Political Action Committee of the NACP. Next Tuesday, uh, October 13th, 